you, they, they, they start to sort of signal to each other. And what they form is something we call xenobots. Now, why xenobots? Because Xenopus Lavis is the name of the frog, and uh, and it's a bio robotics platform. So the way it's the way they're they're swimming is they have little hairs on their surface. These hairs called cilia. Here, what they've done is they've sort of they've learned to row, and so and so the cells uh, the the cilia are moving, and this thing is propelling itself. They can go in circles. They can go straight back and forth like this. Uh, here you can see a bunch of them in their various, uh, this is just tracking data. So, so these two are interacting. These are sitting there doing nothing. This one's going on kind of a longer journey. Um, here, here's one navigating a, a maze. This is still water. There's no water movement in here. So it moves along. It takes the corn without bumping into the opposite wall. And then at some point for reasons that nobody, uh, nobody can predict yet, uh, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. That was Michael Levin talking about his created organism, the Xenobot. That thing has no brains. There's no brains in it. What you saw there was actual the cells, the cells of this organism communicating. Just how does a jellyfish think, right, without a brain? What they're finding here, Michael Levin will surely win a Nobel Prize for this work um, some point in the future of bioelectricity. So he's hacking the actual organisms. How does organisms actually work? How does something regenerate? How does a planarian live forever? How can it regenerate and we just die? We can't even regrow anything, basically. Just an amazing full briefing, amazing information here. And I found some kind of key concepts, key correlations between my own theory and Isaac Newton. What did Isaac Newton create back in the 1700s? He wrote a book, a particular book called Optics. How does that also relate? Exciting show for you guys today. Let's get to it. Chris Lado, welcome to Lado Files. I highly recommend watching this whole briefing by Michael Levin. What he explains here is planaria, the champions of pattern memory. How does memory actually work? How do we remember things? How does biological systems actually remember something? And amazing from these planarias, doesn't matter how you cut these cute little worm guys, they will regrow back. Okay, however it is, back to the full planaria shape. Basically, they are immortal. According to Michael Levin, the planarians are immortal. Think of that. And he found ways to actually code for this, to actually code these in a different organisms. So how could you code an organism? How could a planaria grow back to its original shape? How does it know? Where is that information held? Because Michael Levin says it's not in the DNA. He explains it here. Looks like there are cells that communicate with other cells and networks. These cells have ion channels. So these are little proteins that uh, help set a voltage to the cell. And that voltage may or may not be communicated to its neighbors through these little gap junctions. These are like, um, like electrical synapses that allow electrical information to pass back and forth. And so, so that's the hardware of the brain. And what that hardware enables is a kind of software that, among other things, navigates spaces. So here's a zebrafish. This is a movie uh, taken by, uh, by, by this group uh, here that shows all the electrical activity in the living zebrafish brain. And so the commitment of neuroscience is that if we understood how to decode this information, we would be able to know what the cognitive content of this, of this uh, brain was. So, so the, the memories, the preferences, the goals, whatever, whatever else the system was going to do, we should be able to decode it. So this is, this is that cycle that's called uh, neural, neural decoding, right? We should be able to understand what, what all these patterns mean. That's how your cells work. This is how neurons actually work is through these ion channels. So what is an ion? It's a positively or negatively charged molecule, right? That can affect how the electricity flows through this cell. So these ion channels, these little ion channels actually is what <laughs> promotes the electrical communication through cells, across cells, okay? But those aren't limited to just neurons, okay? Your neurons are just like any other cell, right? Your other cells also have these ion channels. Well, it turns out that uh, this is not just for brains. This is an extremely ancient system. Um, all the cells in your body have ion channels. Most cells have gap junctions with each other. And what we might be able to do is just like neuroscientists, we might be able to extend this whole scheme to ask what are your tissues thinking about at any point in time, specifically to read the electrical. So this is a, this is a time lapse of an early frog embryo. Uh, the colors are a fluorescent dye reporting voltage the same way that we did here, that um, it was done here with these, uh, with these zebrafish. Uh, and uh, you, we might be able to decode this information to ask 
what are the targets in anatomical amorphous space? What is this thing going to build? So think about that. That is just amazing right there. You're seeing actual biological breakthroughs, genetic breakthroughs just happening real time right here. Thanks to Michael Levin. Thank you so much. So look at that. Ion channels. Normal cells communicate. They communicate through these ion channels, right, which handle the voltages, which is the electrical signals, essentially, right, and communicate with other cells through these gap junctions. So all cells can do this. Your neuronal cells are just filling a certain function inside your brain. They're like super nerds of your cells, but all of your cells can actually communicate and talk according to Michael Levin. This means the software. Now we can see them actually communicating. So how does this communication work? And these things will form. Your cells will actually self form into these new organisms, right? To where we could possibly regrow tissue. Think about your cancer cells. Why are cancer cells out of control, right? What if you could bring those cancer cells back into the main organism, right? And Michael Levin basically shows here that we could possibly do this. So he explains here what actually is cancer, right? It's your cells are, they're actually just doing everything for themselves. They've disavowed the larger organism, okay? They're on their own goal. They're not adhering to the larger organism's goals, right? Well, what they found was Michael Levin induced tumors in these tadpoles and then electrically they were able to suppress it right they're basically opening the ion channels the communication pathways back up so like this cancer cell it's separated out of the ion we can't bring it back in right he's tantamount on destroying the whole system or at least helping himself well now you can bring them back in the communication channels open them back up software coded right to software code these cells back so instead of having to remove those cancer cells which are your cells by the way now we could just say hey guys come back into the fold okay you're, you're back you're on the team again right through software coding think about that man unbelievable and finally how it plays into the actual theory my theory on the scales of the universe now we look here into cognitive space so what is the cognitive option space how do these intelligences how do these communication cells form into different organisms okay if you imagine each one of your cells trillions of little cells are communicating talking right to form you to form us okay but does it keep going he argues that you have compound intelligences okay inside the larger system so we're all a part of much larger systems if you look here here's the now the body micro environment territory these are called morphous spaces he argues evolution will actually continue in many many maybe unlimited infinite morphous spaces in in my in my model one of the things that um it allows the framework to do is to compare directly very diverse intelligences. So any intelligence, be it evolved, designed, uh, some sort of hybrid, some sort of alien thing, or maybe soft, pure software, it doesn't matter. Any agent has a set of, that, that can pursue goals, you can simply plot the size of those goals. So, so how big are they in space and time, right? You might have you might have a tick that only cares about local butyrate concentration, and that's all that it's ever going to care about. And so it has a tiny little um, cognitive light cone that allows it to pursue these tiny little goals. And you, or you might have a dog which has a bigger cognitive light cone and has some pretty good memory going backwards, has a little bit of anticipation potential forwards. It's never going to care about what happens two towns over three months from now. It's impossible that its goal space is simply not that big, right? And then you can have humans which uniquely perhaps have uh, have a cognitive light cone that's bigger than their own lifespan. So the the human can comprehend and pursue goals that are that are guaranteed not achievable in your lifetime. And that, for all I know, that may drive some interesting psychological pressures that uh, that humans face. But this idea that that we are all made of a of a collective of agents. Each of these agents is solving problems in its own space. And within that space, there are differently scaled goals. Some, some very, very, you know, very modest, and some, some, some massive. You know, some humans are working for world peace, and 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 you know, these kinds of very complex, very large, long-term things. So the idea is that in this multi-scale system, what happens is that higher levels bend the option space for their subunits. So, so, so in uh, if 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 you've got a morphogenetic space that that uh, that that has attractors for different head shapes. That's because those those bioelectrical states distort the the space of gene expression for their cells, such that all the cells need to do is go down their concentration gradients the way they normally do. They don't have to know where they're going, but in fact, they end up at a very particular uh, morphological um, outcome because because the higher level has already distorted that space, and so. 
there are all kinds of interesting work to be done looking at mathematical formalisms from relativity theory and, and, and from some other um, disciplines to look at how, at how that works. Boom, that's it right there. Michael Levin just said it. The higher dimensions here, if you look here, basically these are how the dimensions are, are labeled, okay? As we go up in size, as you go up in collective groups, the, what happens is the higher dimension will actually set the morphous space, will actually set the limits. Okay, almost software limits of what can be done at the lower dimension. So if you ever wondered why you had to go to school or why you have to pay your taxes, or your limits in life, right? You feel limited by certain requirements that you have to do. These are set by what? They're set by the larger dimension, which in this case is, surprise, the nations, the government, right? Whatever is forcing you, it limits your options. It will actually set the morphological space, actually affects the lower dimensions. Amazing talk. And look at this, he even made these tiers of biological cognition, which is amazing, right? If you go here, here's the cytoskeleton into neural network. You have tissues, then we go the whole organism. Now we go to groups. And look, it stops here, right? Always stops there. Seems to always stop there. But why don't we keep going? So I made my own model. So I basically took his idea of this wheel, if you will, and I call it the staircase to heaven. But what you have here is I overlaid, okay? So these will be the A's, and I tried to uh, basically line it up with the current theory, right? So each one of these is, is three zeros, is a step change, a three zeros. So as we go up the scale ladder, if you can imagine, humans are basically in here. So this is where humans are at this level. And then we go up, this is like the universe, and this is uh, protons down here, okay? Um, quarks, actually. So if you can imagine, that's the scalar collective intelligence of the universe and now how do these align right he talked about relativity what are the relationships well what i noticed is while i was making this okay when i did the original theory and i counted these step changes okay what i saw repeating patterns again when i saw repeating patterns that seemed to continue to repeat i noticed it was at 10 to the 21 zeros okay so very large scale uh changes okay but that's what i noticed i also looked at well what about this why did it come out to when I started counting the the, the uh, colors, what did I come up to again, right? So I started counting what I always use, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, violet, indigo, right? Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, so, and now where did, I looked at where did that come from? Okay, where did that information actually come from? I was very surprised to learn it came from Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. Are you aware he wrote another book? Not just on falling apples. Look at this. Sir Isaac Newton wrote optics. Spelled T-I-C-K-S. Optics. Newton. Man, amazing book. I did not know about this. In this book, okay, he basically identifies and invents, if you will, Roy G. Biff. Okay, he adds indigo. He adds indigo or indica, however you call it. This book, Optics, or A Treatise of the Reflections, Refractions, Inflections, and Colors of Light by Sir Isaac Newton, with a foreword by Albert Einstein. Look at that, man. So awesome. It's a very long book. He goes in all about color. He does tons of experiments. The book has a ton of experiments like this, right? With, through a prism. So basically, he used a prism and did a ton of experiments on it. Did his own experiments and wrote this large book. One of his three books that Sir Isaac Newton wrote. What blew my mind is the color wheel. So he made a color wheel. Why? Based on frequencies, he saw that they're repeated. And white light, Sir Isaac Newton saw that through a prism, white light actually has all of the members of all the, the colors. He, he noted the primary colors as well. But what's quite interesting is that he illustrated this based on the intervals of the musical major scale. He did it off the musical major scale. <laughs> As we go here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And what he saw is it actually repeats, actually repeats again, okay? But is it seven? Is it seven or is it six? In a mixture of primary colors, the quantity and quality of each being given to know the color of the compound. This is where he basically figures out RGB, right? How can you find out the actual color composition? With the center O and radius OD, describe a circle ADF and distinguish its circumference into seven parts. 
proportional to the seven musical tones or intervals of the eight sounds. Sol, la, fa, sol, la, mi, fa, sol, contained in an eight. That is proportional to the number one ninth, one sixteenth, one tenth, one ninth, one sixteenth, one sixteenth, one ninth. Let the first part D represent a red color, and then he goes through each of the colors, okay? I tried to figure out what this means. I don't know why it doesn't go do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, right? It, it has this different setup here based on these numbers that I couldn't really attribute to the, the actual color wheel. Okay, so this is actually the color wheel, right? The frequencies. So in the middle is white light. And basically what he said is if you measure a light, okay, and you have, you measure it here, it has this many lines of orange, this much red, and you mark it here. Now we can determine the actual specific mathematical frequency or color of that color. Okay, so basically he determined the, the wheel. Okay, and these are just the P, this is a circle of P here. This shows how many reds there are. Okay, so that would align to a Z. Okay, the interesting part for me is that basically it came out to seven colors okay so he added this indigo he added it before it was red orange yellow green blue violet okay he actually added indigo and i'm not sure if it's because it has so many more frequencies on the scale i went and looked and actually red has the largest frequency band by nanometers so quite interesting here i tried to find what about a rainbow how many colors does a rainbow actually have it's not so easy to find an actual picture of a prism Okay, but if you look here, this is how it actually breaks out, the rainbow, okay? And what I see is kind of purple over here, and that does seem to come around. Red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and purple. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> that's seven. I don't know, man. I see seven colors. What are the chances? Could it be matched? And in, in, maybe these aren't lined up. You know, maybe these actual... It's based off the intervals of a, of, a, of a major scale. You know, could that be possible? If you think about it, light is made up of waves. Sound is made up of waves. But is it just our perception that gives these colors? Is it just our perception that gives the colors of the visible light? Or is there some other deep mathematical or universal constant or something related to that? So interesting. Thanks so much, Michael Levin. Man, he's just punching through. And now we, with our information age that we're in, we can get so much information so fast. I mean, that video by Michael Levin was released, you know, five days ago. I can make a video about it now, get that information out to you guys. Hopefully it, it breaks something loose and your brain's out there. Let me know in the comments what you think about this theory, what you think about my scales of the universe, the staircase to the heavens. Thanks for being here. Have a great week. Peace.